Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And as we heard in the paper review, the senior Conservative backbencher, former Defence Secretary Liam Fox, is saying this morning the UK should leave the EU. He joins me now from our Glasgow studio. Good morning, Mr Fox. Dr Fox, I beg your pardon. Good morning, Andrew. Now, um, this is a big moment for you. From now on, presumably, you are going to be a voice campaigning until the referendum comes for this country to leave the EU. I am, and uh, I took that decision because, for me, uh, two things had to happen to want to stay in the European Union. One was a fundamental change in Britain's relationship with the European Union, but more importantly, a change in direction for the European Union itself, away from the concept of ever closer union uh, and to mo towards a much more uh, independent and looser association of sovereign states. And that's clearly not going to happen. And so we'll all have to make up our minds, possibly in the next few months, uh, for me, it's now very clear what direction I think we should take as a country. Let me ask about the timing of this, Liam Fox. I mean, because the Prime Minister is engaged right at the moment in the toughest bit of negotiation he's ever done in the EU. He will see this as a bit of a stab in the back, won't he? No, I think that it's very clear from the uh, discussions that are going on in Europe. The other European leaders are making it clear that they intend to move towards ever closer union. I think that's against Britain's national interests. But while the talk may be about accommodating Britain's uh, desires to have a slightly different relationship, as you pointed out earlier in the programme, the European Union is now talking about having a single border force to enforce Europe's external borders for the countries in the Schengen Agreement. And for me, the critical point of that was the fact that this is a force that will be deployed by the Commission not by elected governments and in fact can be done against the will of sovereign governments. That for me is the clearest so possible indication about the direction of travel of Europe and I can't accept that. Now we also read in today's papers that there are members of the cabinet who agree with you and would like to be on the same side, at least three of them and another minister as well. Do you think they ought to be allowed to campaign for Brexit from inside the cabinet or do you think this is a matter of cabinet loyalty and if you, if you disagree with the Prime Minister you should leave? Well, I, I would much prefer them to have the freedom to campaign from within the Cabinet because uh, if you remember the timing of this referendum will come in 2016 or maybe 2017. We have an electoral mandate, we're a majority government in the House of Commons and we'll have to continue to work together to govern the country right up till 2020. I think that is best done by having more freedom for individuals to, to express what's effectively uh, a matter of conscience for them and I think that the more that we're able to give freedom to our colleagues and the more we treat one another's views with respect and tolerance, the easier I think it will be for us to come together after that referendum to continue to govern the country. And I've said very often, you know, that people who want to stay in the European Union uh, are not uh, unpatriotic and people who want to leave are not idiots. Yeah. We need to treat one another's views with genuine respect and tolerance. We have this slightly strange situation which is on your side of the argument, the Brexit side. There are two parallel campaigns campaigns, your campaign, the one you're associated with, and also the UKIP-involved campaign as well. Now, if you're going to be maximally effective against what you would see as the kind of elite establishment stitch-up on the other side, you need to get together, don't you? You need to be able to sit on a platform with, or stand on a platform with Nigel Farage. Could you do that? Oh, yes, definitely. I think it has to become a question of the issue and not a question of personalities. And I think so much of the focus has been on that and not the detailed debate. I think that we need to get away from that. Um, I think you're absolutely correct. I think that the, those who want to leave the European Union need to speak with a much greater, much unified voice than they've had up till this point. Liam Fox, very interesting. We're going to talk, I predict, about this a great deal over the next few months and the substance of the issues. But for, this, for now, for this morning, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Now then, it's 25 years since, in the most dramatic circumstances, Sir John Major became leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister. And you could say the Tories have never really resolved the issue which ultimately led to his predecessor, Margaret Thatcher's fall from power, namely the party's attitude to the European Union. Sir John wrestled with it during his premiership. He also had to deal with war in the Middle East, a recession, global economic uncertainty. Sounds just a tad familiar, Sir John. Thanks for coming in. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, let's start talking a 
little <coughs> bit about the economy and so forth. I remember when I was a very young reporter, and you were a very young prime minister, there was a kind of asset bubble thing going on, and then interest rates ticked up, and we had all sorts of problems with negative equity and so forth. Mm. Now, interest rates are clearly on the move up again, led by the Fed. We have a very, very problematic asset bubble in terms of house prices in the UK, which is leading to inequality, as we were talking about. I just wonder your reflections. 25-odd years on from that, how do you see that problem? I don't think we're going to get rapidly rising <coughs> interest rates at all. In the uh, 1990s, we were on the back of a huge inflationary bubble. I mean, people forget on the day I became prime minister, we were heading into a recession. We had interest rates at 14% and we had inflation at nearly a tenth. 14%, a totally 14%. different world, yes. So to to totally different background. Yeah. Now, the Fed have just ticked up interest rates a little. And I think this will be a very slow process. I don't think we are suddenly going to see a huge spiral in interest rates. I know many mortgage owners in particular will be concerned about that. I very much doubt that is going to happen. But I think um, there are some problems that we can foresee ahead. In a curious way, the very low price of oil is likely to be a problem because many of the countries that have invested, often overseas, are going to be much shorter of cash than they were. I think three large economies will probably be in difficulty next year, uh, Russia, uh, Brazil, and China will slow a little. But overall, I think we'll see the world yeah. economy growing a little faster, and Europe will be growing a little faster as well. You came in as the, as the Brixton boy from a cash-poor <coughs> family in your background and so forth. How worried are you about inequality now? Well, I was worried, and I am worried. I mean, it was a great frustration to me that I had to deal with other things, that the European splits in the party and getting the economy right, and I was never able to do for inequality what I would have wished to do, and that is a lasting regret but it exists and it is it's not the fault of this government or the immediate past governments it has grown up over 40 or 50 years and it is extraordinary that here we are we are the fifth biggest economy in the world we're growing and yet we have seven out of the ten poorest regions in northern Europe now that cannot be right it's wrong but what can be done about it well I think some of it is starting to be done, but there's a great deal more to be done. Uh, the Chancellor's concept of a northern powerhouse is exactly right. We need to spread the wealth in this country uh, more evenly than previously it has been spread. And that means necessarily large-scale capital investment outside London, in the West Country, for example, to open that up to investment in the Midlands and in the north and but that you, is a you, long job but it is necessary but you can't talk about redistrib redistribution you can't talk about taxing the people at the top more without a howls of outrage from all around the place it has become completely impossible to discuss no, well I wasn't talking about taxing people more because if you tax people more you're just going to make us a less competitive economy what I was saying is that we should spread our investment more wisely and we should have uh, perhaps more incentives to encourage people to invest outside the regions that typically have attracted investment into the Midlands, into the North. And it is vitally so important more that we do that. Government strategy really is what I think we've always had a form of intervention. Uh, it depends on how much. Uh, I don't welcome intervention into detail, but I do welcome intervention in encouraging people to invest in our country, and particularly mm. in the parts of our country where people are falling behind. It isn't acceptable. Okay. If you have the degree of inequality that has built up over so long, and I'm delighted that we now have a Chancellor who's seeking to reverse that. Now, you must have had a bit of deja vu over the last <coughs> few days watching David Cameron. I don't know with how many shirts he was carrying with him for those <laughs> negotiations. It wasn't Maastricht, but it wasn't very far away. It was in Brussels and so on. Um, do you think this is a negotiation which is, in a sense, too trivial? Or as some people on the Eurosceptic side of the arm are saying, almost meaningless? Well, isn't it curious? I mean, the Eurosceptics say this is meaningless and it's trivial. And in fact, it embraces many of the things they've been asking for for a very long time. Uh, consider what the Prime Minister is trying to negotiate. He's trying to negotiate an end to our commitment to ever closer union. I think he will succeed in that. Is that trivial? If, if it is, why have the Eurosceptics been asking for it for the last 20 years? He's trying to negotiate more competitiveness, set out very clearly in his letter to Donald Tusk. He's trying to negotiate a whole range of things that matter to us on migrancy, uh, on 
I sent you I'm, seeking to intervene. Do I'm, so now if you wish. The, thank you so much. <laughs> the, the big problem is going to be this very specific promise that he was going to end in-work benefits for four years for EU migrants coming here to work. And that seems to be something that people like, well, certainly the Poles and many other countries, are determined that we will not get. And in a sense, has he not created a problem for himself by saying, I'm going to get this, this is going to be my big sticking point. If he doesn't then get it, it may not be the most important issue, but that's what he will be crucified over. Well, it's a subset of the general migrants issue, of course. Now, whether he will get exactly four years, I can't say. But the whole ethos of the European Union is compromise. The European Union are not going to wish Britain to leave. They're not going to wish Britain to leave because we tend to look here at what our position is. Consider Europe's position were we to leave the European Union. What would Europe lose? Forget what we would lose at the moment. What would the European Union lose? They would a lose... A big export market for a start. Well, that's not quite as true an argument as you may think. But let me deal with the points mm. I was going to raise. Firstly, they will use the best performing economy in Europe they will lose the economy that in 20 years is likely to be the biggest economy in Europe. They will lose the country with the longest and most historic foreign policy reach. They will lose one of only two countries with a military capability and a nuclear capacity. Now, if Europe was formed as it was to look America and China and the big countries of the world in the eye as equals, if Britain comes out, that ambition has gone. So they, they will be, they will be immensely diminished, and they know that. And so they will negotiate. Everybody's setting out positions. It's classic European situation. On both sides, they're setting out positions. And they will meet, and a compromise will be reached. And the compromise won't just deal with trivial issues. Subsidiarity, for example, isn't a trivial issue. We had that in the Maastricht Treaty. Germany and Britain put it in, uh, meaning that things were only done at the European level if they couldn't be done at the national level. And uh, that was agreed mm. at Maastricht and then bypassed by the then Commission. Well, if it's reinserted again, it will be reinserted in a way that they will not be able to bypass. That's essential. Uh, it's very important. Mm. And that's one of the things that has caused so much frustration with the European Union, and there is frustration so right see, the way through the country. On the other side, people say, but in the end, they're not going to change their spots. Charles Moore, I'm not sure that he's your favourite columnist, but he said something very interesting this week I was just quoting. He said two things are going to happen. One is the Prime Minister will come back with something he's able to say, this is a successful renegotiation, look what I've got. But the second thing he said is that this will not fundamentally change either the direction of the EU or our relationship with the EU. On the fundamentals, it remains but the But the same. European Union has already changed with the advent of the Euro zone. What we're heading for boards is uh, a European Union that has a Eurozone and non-Eurozone members. And one of the things the Prime Minister is seeking to negotiate is to protect us from paying for the policies of the Eurozone members. Now that is significantly different. Ally that to an end to ever closer union. And you do begin to see a rather different relationship Add to that subsidiarity and you have a very different relationship. So the argument that the Eurosceptics have been advancing since before the Prime Minister mm. set out his aims, that it would be trivial, is a good negotiating, a good arguing point for them. But it is essentially bogus when you look at the detail of what is actually being discussed. And sticking with a bit of that detail, this business of transitional those benefits, in-work benefits for people coming into this country, the big problem for the Prime Minister is discrimination between one citizen of the EU and another citizen of the EU. Do you think that can be overcome? <laughs> well, it's an interesting word, discrimination, isn't it? Uh, we're saying there's discrimination if people don't get exactly the same benefits. You could equally argue that it's discrimination that people who are watching this programme have been paying into our national insurance system for 40 years and someone arriving on day one gets exactly the same benefits. I think that's an equal form of discrimination. And I think we're going to have to recognise that, and I don't know what the outcome will be, but I think there will be a compromise. There will be some kind of compromise. I think so. What about the other great issue, I suppose, at the moment, which is open borders? I mean, this has produced probably an existential crisis, an mm. overused mm. word. Mm. Mm. Private mm. I will start to an existential crisis <laughs> column quite soon. But nonetheless, a very, very big crisis for Europe. This Europe of open borders, the Schengen Europe, people are able to move from one country to another very quickly. Liam Fox has raised the question of terrorists as well being able to use this. And this does worry an awful lot of people watching this programme. Indeed it does. And, I, I, and of course they're right to worry about that. Mm. Uh, the question is whether we would be able to stop that in anything we did. Now, if we actually look at the question of freedom of movement, well, there are several things to say about it. Well, firstly, 
freedom of movement is said to be sacrosanct because it is one of the four European freedoms. That is a totally phony argument. Another of the four European freedoms is fr uh, freedom of movement of goods and services. Yet Germany and France and other countries block our banking, block our insurance, block our technology services. So the belief that that is absolutely You're fundamental to is unchanging. Like Liam Fox at this point. Huh? No, well they so do, far. they do, and mm. that's what the sort of thing we're going to have to change. The bigger issues are why I'm absolutely convinced we need to stay in for our future. But, but that means, on the question of the sheer flow of people coming here, here is a matter where we should move away from uh, rigid positions and look at the reality. It is not common sense to sweep into countries more people than we can provide for if they are sick, than we can house or we can educate. And we need a common sense position. Let us accept the principle of free movement, but it has to be mitigated to deal with the number of people that yes. can be accepted in any given period. And that again is a piece of common I, 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 sense negotiation that and yet, to be clearly, accepted to our acceptable to our partners. If, if we left, we would get control of our borders back, period. Well, consider what that means. Half our immigration at the moment doesn't come from the European area. It comes from the old Commonwealth and but elsewhere. But we would have control over that. Just a that. moment. Mm. And we have been, well, we've been letting more people in than most of the people mm. objecting to us being in Europe would like. But without them, we wouldn't have a transport system. We probably wouldn't, we certainly wouldn't have a national health system. Mm. So let's not assume that immigration per se sure. is a bad thing it isn't and neither is it per se a bad thing from Europe it's the sheer total of it now if we had control of our own borders I wonder what would happen with all the people who had got into Calais to France would the French keep them there or would they say well this is no longer our problem Britain's outside the European Union mm. we're no longer going to do as David Cameron agreed with us that we would which is hold them at Calais do we want that sort of situation to arise? Do we really believe that in a world of an open world that we have at the moment that we can suddenly opt out and become a closed nation? I tell you, Andrew, it's a fantasy. Is it? Well, I mean, a lot of people would say, first of all, that the French are allowing many of those migrants to go to Dunkirk and other places and they are coming into the country. But second, if we had a hard border of our own, we could stop them coming in. Do you really think that is so? Well, I have no idea. Do you really think I, I, that is so? And do you really think of all the implications of that would necessarily be right in terms of our international reputation, our international trade, and all the mm. things that go with it? I don't think that is the case. And I right. think we are better able to deal with this problem collectively rather than siphoning ourselves off, cutting ourselves away from the biggest single market in the world and seeking to negotiate a new arrangement with that single market which would be less convenient and less good for us. Though, of course, they are selling us much more in goods than we are selling them. You see, there's a fallacy in that argument. Many of the things that they sell to us, we wouldn't be able... They would continue selling them to us because that's covered by wider treaties than simply the European treaties. The converse would be that the things we want to sell to them, services and other things, can be blocked by the Europeans. So it would be very much to our overall disadvantage. Okay, what, one, Added what, to which, one final... Of course, there are 27 of them, there are one of us. So I think you, okay. the belief that Europe's going to collapse if it loses the UK market is, is a wrong. bit wider the mark. One final question on this. I mean, you have intervened in this argument today. Um, how big an argument is it for the country? Alan Johnson, who's leading the Labour campaign to stay in Europe, was on the programme a couple of weeks ago, and he said um, that he thought it was a once-in-a-lifetime, possibly 30- or 40-year kind of decision. Do you take the same view? I think it's a long-term decision. I mean, the argument that we can have a referendum, say no, and then go back and renegotiate is just a fallacy. If we come out, we are out. That's it. It's not politically credible to go back and uh, say, we've reconsidered, right. let's have another referendum. If we vote to stay out, then we are out and we will have to get on with it and face the consequences, which will be many and varied. Of course we will survive. We're a big and a powerful nation. Of course we will. That's not the point. Point is, would we be as safe? No. Would be as well off? No. Would we be as influential? No. So that is the point that is really at issue. Very clear. So, John, for now, thank you very much thank you. for joining us. Oh, so, John Major is still with me, and we've been joined again by Joan Bakewell.
Uh, Sir John, we've now got potentially three members of the Cabinet who want to campaign alongside Liam Fox for Brexit. Should they be allowed to stay in the Cabinet and disagree with the Prime Minister while doing so? I spent uh, the best part of seven years trying to keep a party at civil war over Europe together. Um, and I think it would be extraordinary if anybody decided to campaign against Cabinet policy at least until the negotiations are completed. When the negotiations are completed, I would very much hope that they would not wish to campaign against the cabinet. But and certainly, if they but did, certainly, they be allowed to stay in the circle. Well, I think that's a big if. If is the longest preposition <laughs> in the English language, and I'm not getting drawn on that this morning. Um, but certainly, between now and the end of the negotiations, absolutely not. And I would hope afterwards that they would not wish to, mm. because the unity of the argument for the sake of the country. Not this is bigger than the Conservative mm. Party. The argument for the sake of the country is very important and people deserve to hear a clear-cut argument, not an internecine piece of party strife. Joan. This is uh, clearly Cameron's opportunity for leadership. This is what going to call on leadership as never before. And if he is going to come back with a, a negotiation that satisfies him, he has got to be able to sell it to the cabinet. He's got to be able to sell it to the country, of course. But he must, it's going to lead the stay in campaign, which he wants to do so and which his colleagues in Europe point, want him to do. He's got to lead. If them. he can't convince his own cabinet, he's unlikely to convince the country. I personally believe he will come back with a satisfactory deal. Mm. and he will be able to convince the country. The trouble with the European debate, ever since it began, is in terms of public presence, it's often conducted at the extremes. Mm. People who will never really be persuaded that we should be in, and people who are utterly convinced that we should not leave. Under now, in the midst of that, it's under, the rest of us. under almost any, un, in the middle of it, is the rest of us. And it is the rest of us, the great mass of the British people, whom David Cameron will have to convince that it is better for our future, their children and their children, and our international influence, that we should stay in a world that is drawing together, rather than exclude ourselves and become an offshore island, a big and a powerful one admittedly, but an offshore island of the biggest uh, continent right. and market in the world. Okay. Joan Bakewell, youthful, vigorous member of the House of Lords, Sir John Major both. Thank you very much indeed for joining us.